an internationally recognized finance academic and formerly a senior figure in the fund management industry. He's also the chair of financial technology at Ulster University, Ulster, sorry. Um, he's also a specialist in financial technology. In addition to being um, a leader and influencer, he conducts research into capital markets and digital technologies. Uh, Professor Daniel has written several books and peer-reviewed papers, and he has a book uh, called A Guide to Fund Management and another one, The Changing Face of European Fund Management, The Future of the UK Fund Management Industry, and a lot more. Um, Daniel has, ha um, has had different uh, uh, board positions as well in regulated companies, including a, lead uh, a leading asset manager and a number of collective investment vehicles. Um, he uh, sorry vehicles. Uh, he also has had a board a broad a board experience uh, as a non-executive at a large pension administrator and as an independent director at the family office at ultra high net worth individual. He served on the board of a number of financial sector professional bodies and was awarded the with this awarded the CFA Institute uh, Society Leader Award in recognition of his uh, work towards that. Professor Broby has a PhD in accounting and finance, an MPhil in economics, and an MSc in investment analysis. He was elected an individual member of the London Stock Exchange in 1990, and he is a chartered fellow of the CISI and a fellow of CFA UK. And above all of that, he is an amazing photographer, and I love uh, uh, seeing all the, the lovely uh, show, uh, photographs that he takes. So without Further delay, I leave now um, the floor for Daniel uh, to um, speak about his uh, very, very interesting uh, paper. And I've also um, uh, sent the link on the chat if you want to uh, check the paper um, during or after the presentation. Thank you so much, Daniel, for your time and for joining us today. Great. Thank, Thank you, Christine. And uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, let me just uh, share the slideshow. Yep, all good. OK, so I'm going to talk about a paper that we have produced, which we published in Finance Research Letters, uh, which is a uh, journal where you can publish important results uh, fast as a letter rather than as a paper. Uh, and so in that respect, uh, the results from uh, what we have looked at, which is enhancing a statistic for portfolio optimization. Uh, was considered uh, important enough to uh, to do through that process. So what we did was we modified the Gerber statistic, and I'm going to come on and explain what that is, and I'll also explain a little bit about uh, how co-movement uh, and how stocks vary and co-vary, so you can understand the nature of this statistic. Uh, and our modification comes around the redefinition of zones and thresholds. And again, I'm going to explain that for you. Uh, so effectively, what we have done is we have contributed to the literature in portfolio construction and provided a tool that captures an element of unpriced risk. So the two references that are relevant, uh, so the Gerber statistic uh, was published by a number of uh, eminent uh, academics and practitioners, uh, co-led by Gerber, who is a uh, well-known hedge fund manager, uh, Harry Markovitz, who I hope you all know won the Nobel Prize for his contribution in 1959 to modern portfolio theory, uh, Ernst, um, Philip Ernst, who's uh, a professor chair of statistics at Imperial College, uh, Ying Sen Mao, um, who's the uh, uh, chief data scientist at one of the largest asset managers in the world, and uh, two further hedge fund managers, um, Javid and Sargon. So a really powerful lineup of people who came together and actually produced the Gerber statistic, which was only published uh, effectively uh, recently, the beginning of this year, uh, in the Journal of Portfolio Management. So as you can see, uh, our work uh, was an immediate response to that uh, in finance research letters. So firstly, what is it uh, that we're trying to identify? We're, we're effectively recognising co-movement between equities. And we all know that uh, there is co-movement between equities, uh, but sometimes that co-movement can be subs uh, substantial 
and sometimes it can just be noise. So what we and what Gerber have done is identify where there is information in that co-movement, uh, which obviously is very relevant to anyone who wants to create portfolios. Uh, so in this respect, there's a core difference between the Gerber statistic and ours, uh, and that is that we can, by modifying it, produce enhanced zoning decisions. In other words, we can get more from the informational content of that and therefore prove more helpful to active asset managers. Now, our results are produced in exactly the same code uh, that was produced by Gerber tool and published on GitHub. So the link is there. So anyone who wants to effectively uh, add this to their papers can use the same code and uh, therefore uh, replicate not just uh, Gerber's results, but our results um, and indeed uh, do uh, sort of empirical investigation of their own. Let me just really take a very simplistic look at co-movement and essentially we all know that stocks can go up together. Uh, we also know that they can go down together uh, and we know that they go up and down and down and up. So that's fairly self-evident. What, what that gives us is a quadratic potential outcome. So that potential outcome is what uh, Harry Markowitz first identified when he was writing uh, his uh, thesis on modern portfolio theory, uh, because what that does is it creates this interesting mathematical relationship between pairs of securities, such that if you combine them, the risk shown on the bottom axis here in standard deviation uh, has a, um, a non-linear relationship uh, to um, the expected return there. And so what you get is you get what we call the benefits of diversification. And as you know, in finance, there are only two free rides that we get. Uh, one is compound interest and the other is diversification. Uh, so in that respect, that's a really powerful conclusion. Uh, and what it creates is what we call an efficient frontier. In this case, an efficient frontier between two stocks. Obviously, if you've got a correlation of minus one, uh, and you can get a correlation of minus one because you can go into the uh, options or futures and take an opposing position, uh, then uh, you, you would end up obviously uh, on the vertical axis. And uh, if you had plus one, then obviously you've just got a simple straight line. But obviously anywhere in between, uh, you get this curve curvilinear relationship, as you can see there. And that's the basis of modern portfolio theory. So what that means for us practically in portfolio management and construction is that if using the expected return of uh, portfolio A uh, being obviously uh, in this respect greater than the expected return of portfolio B, then we've got an inefficient portfolio. So nobody is going to hold it as long as portfolio B is available. So what that means is if you take each of these smaller uh, efficient frontiers, which are shown there by those little nested ones, and you combine them together with other stocks, you actually produce a efficient frontier of a collection of assets which is superior uh, to all others and that's essentially what we're trying to achieve uh, when we optimize portfolios. That means that we can put in a number of inputs so the inputs to mean variance analysis being expected return, the return variance and uh, standard deviation, uh, correlation between risky assets and the covariance between the risky assets. So as I just shown you, they, they go up and down, down and up and, and so forth. So they, so equities both vary and co-vary, which gives uh, the uh, famous equation that comes from Markowitz, where you can, uh, if you've got the portfolio variance, so you've got your uh, standard deviation of your portfolio, it's the sum of the number of stocks and then the weights of I and the weights of J, uh, then looking at that. So 
extending that to two stocks, you can see immediately in the second equation how you've got uh, both the variance and the covariance functions in the algebra. And to extend that to any number of stocks up to infinity, obviously there aren't infinity stocks in the, the universe, uh, but uh, what you then get is you can just simply add to that equation and it just gets longer and longer, but still the mathematics works. So that's the background. Uh, and that creates the efficient frontier of risky assets that we uh, know. And actually, if you draw the tangent line from the expected return where the risk-free rate is to that efficient frontier, you get the market proxy, which like, links it back to the capital asset pricing model, because that is the optimal portfolio. Because uh, as you know, uh, from Tobin separation theory, you can uh, lend or borrow uh, from that portfolio as a base and thereby achieve superior outcomes. And therefore there is only one optimal portfolio as such. So in terms of the, the literature, uh, Markowitz obviously uh, sort of came up with most of that theory uh, and uh, the, the fact that obviously co-movement um, and diverge and so forth. Uh, but there's an element of co-movement that isn't captured. So if you look at the um, traditional asset pricing models, you will see that there is system, uh, systemic risk, but there is, and, and there is also the risk that you can diversify away being the company stock specific risk. And as you know, the discounted cash flows of future cash flows are Theoretically, uh, the share price, um, if you divide by the number of shares in issue. So the, the big issue then comes, what is co-movement that is unpriced? So if you have, for example, a stock coming in or out of an equity index, and we know that when that happens, there are movements, and because there's so much passive money, the stock jumps up. That is not a cash flow event. So that is not something which uh, should theoretically impact the share price. Uh, likewise, it's not something that is systemic. It's not something that moves all stocks. It's just a stock going in and out of an index. So that just one example shows that you can have unpriced risk. Uh, and not only can you have unpriced risk, uh, but the traditional models can't factor that in. Hence the need for a measure like Gerber and the adjustment that we do. The other thing is that that efficient frontier wobbles about. It's hard to uh, identify it in real time because it moves, uh, it's equities uh, vary, co vary, and co move literally um, in uh, every moment of the day. So that element is called estimation risk the risk involved in estimating that efficient frontier. And that was proposed by Jobson and Corky, uh, 1980. So as a result, uh, finance uh, academics have approached this problem by saying, well, how can we do this? And they've effectively approached it by a method of shrinkage. So shrinkage means that, as I showed you what the inputs were to create uh, the, the things. Essentially what you want to do is you want to shrink it to the most simplified model appropriate, which is the single index model. In other words, we're just looking at the sum of the market and therefore those inputs are just what the inputs are for the whole market as a whole. And therefore, once again, you can return to uh, modern portfolio theory and, and justify it. So this is relevant because uh, if we're going to propose a measure, and if Gerber has a measure, it has to be tested against not just historic correlation uh, of, of market bits, but it also has to be tested against shrinkage of um, proposed by Jurian in, in 1985. In other words, we have to show that any measure we make is robust against what is currently used in the literature. Uh, obviously, uh, this um, approach uh, of shrinkage and historic correlation actually ignores what's going on in practice because we know that fund managers basically are trying to find these 
events that are unpriced because that's how they achieve alpha. Uh, and that was a critique proposed by Pastor in 2000. So there you have the background literature to this. Uh, and uh, there's, as you know, of um, literature on uh, efficiency of markets, on shrinkage, on estimation risk, uh, but not very much on co-movement because until this year, uh, it's been really difficult to measure as such uh, and, and identify what's going on. And so therefore it was largely attributed to statistical noise. So if you think to the capital asset pricing model and you get to the end of it and there's that little E, uh, that's the, uh, the residual, but that residual has explanatory power. So that essentially means that we need to spend more time looking at co-movement. Uh, and as a result, what we're trying to do is identify unpriced co-movement. And there's two categories of that. There's one uh, called category-based co-movement, and that's where investors classify different securities uh, into the same asset class and shift resources in and out of that class in correlated ways. So think, for example, uh, uh, Think, for example, the um, dot-com bubble or whatever, where uh, the co-movement was occurring as people participated in the speculatory boom that was related to technology in 2000. And then there's also habitat-based co-movement, where a group of uh, investors restricts its trading to a given set of securities. So in other words, there are specialists, for example, in investment trusts. Those uh, investment trusts as you can know, and there's a lot of literature on investment trust discounts and premiums effectively move in a way that is not related to the stock market itself uh, in as much as uh, the systemic risk. It's very difficult to look and, and price them in that respect. So there you have habitat-based co-movement in uh, the way that investment managers look at those things. So risk on buy stocks, um, premium uh, you know, at a premium uh, and obviously risk off them. They, they move to a discount in terms of investment trust. So obviously it's, it's very comfortable to call it noise, but we uh, white noise or, or whatever, because that fits in with um, martingales and efficient market theory and stuff like that. And you can say, well, you know, okay, things, things are varying. And so, you know, so long as it all works in aggregate, why not? But actually that's not the sort of quantitative discipline that we are in finance. So we decided to, uh, well, we, we, we read Gerber and we thought, wow, they've actually cracked something. And the fact that Markowitz was involved is also interesting because Gerber proposed this and went to Markowitz and said, am I right? And Markowitz said, well, I like this, let, let's do that. So there you've got the endorsement of the father of modern portfolio theory and someone who's won a Nobel Prize saying this makes sense. So you're addressing the noise in the covariance matrix, the historic covariance matrix that, that Markowitz uses in his modern portfolio theory. So the, we, we extended this statistic. Now this statistic for anyone who's mathematically orientated is just an extension of Kendall's Tau. Uh, and we basically just made it more discerning. In other words, uh, to, to be more sensitive um, to what's going on in what we call thresholds and zoning structure. So we'll, we'll talk on, on that. Uh, now, Gerber uses counts and uh, we, we use his uh, contribution. So that's how you, you, you have to understand it if you're hopefully going to reference us, for example, uh, in any paper that you're doing on portfolio construction. Okay, so, so our enhanced Gerber statistic is used to um, uh, effectively reduce unpriced risk. So there you have Gerber statistic, the, the formula, so the little G, I, uh, J uh, in, uh, to T, uh, showing uh, what has to be done to effectively create or identify the qualifying co-movements. And then they look at those in a look back window uh, and uh, that is able to identify concordant, discordant and neutral uh, signals, uh, if you want to, to think of it like that, information signals. 
So that statistic is very well suited to co-movement between financial time series because it's insensitive to extremely large movements. So uh, as a result of that, uh, it means that the small movements are essentially noise. Uh, so that's really very useful because it means that all the sort of, uh, you know, sort of irrational things uh, that you uh, that, that some people would say uh, are present in uh, even uh, a, an efficient market uh, uh, can actually be separated from those that have this informational content. Uh, so they also tested this uh, against historic correlation and against shrinkage, as I've just explained why. Uh, and they came to some very powerful conclusions, hence the reason why it was published. Our uh, immediate response was, well, hang on, the counts is a nice way to do it, but it's a blunt instrument. Uh, so what we did was we, uh, and, and you can see the formula is pretty similar. Uh, but so what we did is we just said, well, actually, the threshold is what's relevant. And instead of just saying how many times in, in, as a count, we thought, well, what's, why not use standard deviations? Because those are events that are on a distribution, and then we can incorporate the significance of the movement rather than just the movement itself. Uh, so that then has obviously a number of consequences. And so we're using the same nine assets uh, that Gerber and uh, et al. looked at. Uh, we ran our tests uh, on those uh, using uh, effectively uh, monthly data from 1988 to December 2020. Uh, and that effectively gave us 396 observations. Uh, so it's statistically valid. Um, so here's the adjustment uh, in, in its entirety, but I, I would direct you to the paper uh, if, if you want to uh, look at that. And actually, uh, we've got another paper currently under review uh, where uh, we go further into the method and uh, actually um, the, the, the enhancement uh, and uh, hopefully make a uh, interesting contribution to how you can optimize portfolios from a practical point of view. And that's because I, when you see the results, you'll see that there is immediate benefits to uh, the usage of this. So in terms of uh, the zones that I've been talking about, uh, we believe that what it does is it identifies, uh, our adjustment uh, identifies what's called a zone of confusion. Uh, so in other words, where the noise uh, isn't really uh, contributing to uh, anything. And so each of these points being asset pairs uh, allows us to plot that in a way that we can see where the information from the decision making process comes from. Uh, and then likewise, there's another element of it, which is the zone of indecision, uh, where obviously we are also getting information uh, where we've got various delineation points and so forth uh, that uh, also allow us to uh, see whether or not uh, assets are behaving as they should do. And uh, if you've got some co-movement that ends up in that in, uh, in decision point, then you just don't use it in your decision making process. So in other words, uh, and as I said, you can get the code um, from GitHub, but in other words, you are screening, if you like, the pairs uh, so that we end up with just those pairs that have informational value. So in terms of results, remember I said that this uh, line here that you can see, we can see four lines, uh, is the efficient frontier. And that is what you want to achieve through your process of uh, going through uh, and, and creating your historic correlation uh, tables and so forth. So we've plotted our results against the historic correlation in blue, uh, the uh, shrinkage uh, in green, uh, the Gerber uh, in uh, the red, and uh, our own uh, results in black, uh, SB for Smith Broby, so my co-author. Uh, and so in, in that respect, you can see immediately in this 
rather selective chart uh, that we have outperformed all of them, uh, at least from the period on there from effectively 2002 to 2004. Likewise, uh, similarly, you can see on the other chart uh, a, a very striking result from 1992 to 1994. Uh, some more results. Uh, sometimes, uh, remember what I said about estimation risk, sometimes uh, the, the, the efficient frontiers overlap, as you can see there, and then sometimes uh, Gerber is superior to ours, which is shown on that one in the right where the red is. So the Gerber statistic is still has value, uh, and uh, there's a, a number of um, future investigations as to the difference between which statistic, i.e. ours, the smith uh, Broby statistic, or uh, the Gerber uh, statistic, uh, why they should be superior in any particular time. Uh, I suspect, obviously, it depends upon the sort of market conditions that, that, that are being faced. Now, obviously, you can say, well, that's fairly selective. You've just shown uh, four snapshots. Uh, we've basically done a series of 372 combinations. And so rather than just show you all of those, um, I'll just tell you sort of uh, how much, how many times our statistic produces a lead frontier, which is in 72% of occasions. So you can immediately see that actually what this is doing is it's creating a superior sharp ratio to what we traditionally view as the efficient frontier. So in other words, the portfolios in 72% of instances are outperforming the point at which the optimal portfolio lies. And as you know from the literature on performance persistence and so forth, uh, that is a really very strong and striking result, hence the reasons why uh, finance research letters, letters rush through our results because uh, essentially that's either an anomaly in the market or the efficient frontier and the estima estimation risk uh, is being uh, suboptimally calculated. And I think I'd probably fall in the camp of saying it's suboptimally calculated. But either way, using this method in a practical context will allow you to deliver risk adjusted outperformance relative to the index before uh, obviously costs are taken into account and there's a big debate about uh, costs and so forth. So there you have it in terms of uh, the conclusion. Uh, this is Gerber, it all is an important step forward in portfolio management and portfolio construction and the entire um, sort of line of uh, thinking for the future of how we look at problems related to estimation risk. Uh, and it's also a very useful tool for just uh, analyzing financial time series and trying to understand why, why pairs do what they do. Uh, now, obviously, Gerber has, as I showed in, in one of the charts, that their statistic outperformed uh, over certain sets. Uh, so obviously, uh, what can be done is that you can basically create a more holistic co-movement measurement process, and actually you can produce the statistics together uh, as a, a sort of explanatory uh, sort of thing. So both Gerber and uh, the smith Broby adjustment combined, if, if produced on a set of portfolio outcomes uh, and both are reported, then you really have got a combination, in other words, a, uh, the, the contribution of co-movement, uh, which is superior to um, historic correlation and shrinkage, which is the, the important message. So we don't look to replace the Gerber statistic. Um, we can use it alongside it. Uh, and obviously that then produces a distribution of the sum of contributions uh, across concordant, discordant, and uh, neutral contributions. So. Uh, I hope uh, I, I've made it uh, easy to understand uh, and uh, I, I look forward to your questions. We can probably stop the recording at this point. Right?